as you can tell following some of my recent lessons, I've been going through some of the attributes of God. And today, wow, there we go. Today we'll be talking about, um, we'll be looking at the wisdom of God today. Um, and I've really enjoyed, I think at any time that we, we pro, I, obviously any time we focus on God and who he is and what he's done for us and, and just what he's capable of doing and how he interacts with our lives. Um, there's a lot of value in that. Um, but I've really enjoyed looking at his attributes specifically, and, and I feel like it brings me so much closer to God. I, um, in preparing the, when I first decided to do the wisdom of God as a lesson, I sort of taught a little bit of this in Sunday school a while back, and my first thought was, well, this seems pretty pretty basic um, wisdom of God. There's, okay, so God's really, really smart. Uh, that's easy enough to wrap my head around. I, I get that. Um, what, I mean, how much can you really talk about how wise God is? Um, but the more I dug into it and the more that I, I saw the, the uh, ramifications of, of, of our understanding of his wisdom and how it affects our lives, um, you know, I, it occurs to me that I think one of the things that we struggle the most with in our faith is God's wisdom. It's one of the things that 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 requires the most faith for us to 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 recognize and trust in God's wisdom. Um, let's start, as we always do, with the definition of wisdom. Um, this is from again dictionary.com. Uh, the quality or state of being wise. Okay, that's not particularly helpful. Um, knowledge of what is true or right, coupled with just judgment as to action. Sagacity, sagacity, discernment, or insight. This is a pretty good definition. You'll notice in the first part of this definition, I, I, like, I like that it does this. It, it combines two different things. It combines um, knowledge with judgment. So... There's what is known. So somebody has to know what is true. They say knowing is half the battle. Um, knowledge is important for there to be true wisdom. And then the second part of that is knowing what to do or doing something with that knowledge. So there's the knowledge and then there's the doing of the something with that knowledge, the judgment. Um, I have a theologian's definition. Uh, Louis Burkhoff. Um, he says the attribute of God, uh, wisdom is the attribute of God by which he produces the best possible results by the best possible means. So the idea here is not only does God have this perfect plan for us and for his, for his um, universe, um, he has these perfect goals. Not just that, though, he has perfect means to achieve, achieve them. There's a perfect way uh, that God has of going about achieving his plans. Um, I mentioned that wisdom is one of those things that we struggle with uh, in terms of requiring a lot of faith. And I wanted to look biblically at this, um, sort of switching gears here. A year ago, um, I had a series of lessons in which um, I, I talked about one of my favorite Old Testament characters, Habakkuk. Habakkuk was a prophet who was struggling with the sin of God's people and why was God allowing those, why was he allowing this sin to run rampant in his, amongst his chosen people, Israel? Um, and he, he cries out to the Lord. Uh, this is Habakkuk 1, verse 2. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgments proceed. Habakkuk is asking God, why are you allowing your, these are supposed to be your people and they're being evil, and they're doing evil things, they've turned away from you, why do you allow that? God's, 
Habakkuk's questioning God here. He's not questioning, what is he questioning? He is not questioning God's holiness. In fact, he holds up God's holiness in front of God and says, you're a holy God, how can you, how can you put up with this? He's not questioning his holiness. He's not questioning his goodness. Um, he's not even questioning his sovereignty or his power. He, he recognizes that God has the power to, to do something about it. So why, God, aren't you? He's questioning God's wisdom. Why, why, why is this the means by which you're trying to accomplish your goal? He goes on in the next chapter, and he elaborates on that. You are of pure eyes and to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacher treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a per person more righteous than he? Habakkuk is trying to understand why God is doing the things he is. Now, Habakkuk, after asking these questions, was blessed with some answers. God explained his wisdom to him. He laid it out and he said, this is why, this is what's going to happen, and this is why. And then he sort of, at the end of, he, he puts on a display of his holiness and power to which Habakkuk's humbled and recognizes that God is capable of, of making these judgments and decisions in his wisdom. But we see other people in the, in the Bible who question God. It's, and, and a lot of times, well, frequently, these are very righteous people with righteous goals. Here we see David in the book of Psalms. David has a number of psalms where he cries out to God, why? And this is one of my favorites. I, I, I like this psalm, Psalm 13, because of the personal nature of it. It just has sort of a poetic feel, and there's this intensity to it. And it's very personal. Oh, Lord, how, or how long, oh, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long uh, will I, shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow, in my heart daily. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him, lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. David is questioning God. And David's a godly man. He has godly desires. And he recognizes God as being powerful enough to to save him out of his troubles. Um, he knows that God loves him, but he's wondering why is God putting him through this difficult circumstance? Um, one of my other favorite uh, Old Testament characters is Elijah. After uh, one of my favorite stories in the Bible was when Elijah confronts Ahab and his prophets and, and they have a contest between Baal and God and God rains fire down and uh, all the prophets of Baal are killed, and it's it's a great victory. And yet, the next thing that happens is Je uh, Jezebel, the queen, turns around and and starts to look for Elijah to put him to death with her soldiers. Elijah runs off into the woods. Um, or, I'm sorry, not the woods, into the desert. Uh, and here in First Kings 19, verse 9. Um, and there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? So Elijah said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. I've done all the things you've asked me to do, Lord, and nothing's changed. Everything's the same. There's been no result whatsoever. And, okay, so this isn't actually a question. But it is a question. Elijah, this is Elijah's way of questioning God. I did everything you wanted me to, but I'm not seeing any results. I'm not seeing any fruit. Twice, um, Elijah, if you want to memorize one verse and have two verses memorized at once, you can memorize verse 10 because he repeats it verbatim several verses later in the chapter. He, um, God, why... He's, he's wanting to know why God has put him through all this, and he's done all these great things, and yet he doesn't seem to be, God's plan doesn't seem to be moving forward. And yet, in God's wisdom, we see that it did. And 
God did open Elijah's eyes. He opened his eyes and he showed him that there's still several thousand people who haven't bowed their knees to Baal. I have a remnant there. Um, everything you did is not a waste of time. Um, and I have a plan and it will be executed in my wisdom. Um, here's one of my favorite of, of the questionings. Um, this is a, also very personal in nature. So this has to do with Lazarus. When Lazarus died, a close friend of Jesus. And Jesus was away when Lazarus was sick, and he was told that Lazarus was sick, and uh, you better get back so you can heal him. And Jesus was busy doing his ministry, and he was, um, uh, it just took him a while to get back to Lazarus. Well, in the meantime, Lazarus died. And so when Jesus went back to, to Lazarus, Lazarus has already had been buried in the tomb. Um, and the people were around mourning, and Jesus shows up, and he weeps with them. Verse 36, then the Jews said, see how he loved him? And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? That's a really good question. And it's not a question of faithlessness. It's actually a question of faith. These people were recognizing that Jesus had the power to have saved this man, why, why did he let him die? Because he, he could have been there. He could have saved him, and yet he didn't. And, of course, Jesus answers, gives them an answer, and, and it has to do with God's wisdom that all these things were done so that Jesus would be glorified and that people would understand what he's capable of doing. Um, and the last example I have here, was one that Don touched on last Sunday, uh, having to do with the Apostle Paul. This is the Apostle Paul writing here. Uh, it's in the, from the book of Romans, chapter 9. Paul sort of takes a couple chapters and discusses the state of Israel. And in these chapters, well, here, I'll just read the, the first few verses of chapter 9 here. I tell you the truth in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow in my heart, or sorrow and continual grief in my heart. These are passionate words here. For I wish that I that, for I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. He's he's lamenting for the fact that he the these people who are God's chosen people. That, he, that, that, that Paul loved, because he was one of them, um, they had turned away from God. They had all these things that God had given. They had all the advantages. They were God's chosen people, and they had turned away. They had rejected the Messiah. In fact, he, account, he recounts all of the uh, advantages they had in verse 4. Who are, uh, who are the Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the, the glory, the covenants were given to them, the giving of the law, all that was through Israel, the service of God, the promises, all the prophecies that went with Israel, um, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ himself came. Jesus Christ was a, was a, was a Jew, and God used this chosen nation of Israel to, in fleshly terms, produce uh, Jesus Christ, who is over all and etern eternally blessed, all right, in turn, yeah, who is overall the eternally blessed God, amen. So Paul admits here to struggling with Israel's apparent blindness, uh, and it's caused him a great deal of grief. Um, it seemed as though God had such great plans for this nation of Israel, and it seems like just at the critical moment, they've fallen on their face, and they've failed through unbelief. Uh, he goes on the next chapter, and he uh he talks even more about it. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Israel was God's chosen people. Why? The, the question is in, implied here. Why would God choose them if they were just going to fail at the critical moment by rejecting the Messiah? And this is a, a huge question. Um, for the better part of a thousand years, God had invested 
a great deal of his love and energy and promises, all the things that you saw in the previous in the previous passage, he had invested all those things in Israel, and here they are turning away from him just when they should have been receiving him as their Messiah. Now, Paul's in a unique position here because he has these concerns and burdens on his heart, but he also has God explaining to him his plan and the wisdom of his plan uh, concerning the nation of Israel. God is revealing that, uh, his divine plan concerning Israel and uh, Christ the church directly to Paul during this time. And at the end of Paul explaining this, um, I think, like I said, Don talked about this last week. He mentioned that at the end of the passage, he erupts in a, a, a benediction of praise because he can't help himself, which he does. But that benediction of praise is very specific uh, to what he was just talking about. Paul erupts and says, Oh, the depth of riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Paul here is recognizing that all these things that were done are really confusing and really frustrating, had, had been really confusing and really frustrating to Paul. Paul now is enlightened and he sees that this is all part of God's wisdom, God's infinite and perfect wisdom and knowledge. Um, and in each one of these cases, <clears throat> we have these glimpses of these great men of the Bible uh, as we see them struggle with, why is God doing this? And then, in most cases, God explains to them, well, this is what I'm doing. Here's why I'm doing it. I have this plan, and this is how it's going to work. And he explains his wisdom to, to God. And here we have, have Paul recognizing that at the end of ver verse, uh, uh, cha the, um, sorry, chapter 11 of Romans, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Um, we can't comprehend the, the wisdom and knowledge of God. It's, it's something that's, that's hard to wrap our head around. I've heard some stories. I've heard one recently um, that I really liked, uh, and I'll share it with you. It, it helped me at least. I found it thought-provoking. Um, it's, it's by a guy, uh, the guy who told it was a guy named Chip Ingram. I thought he told it really well. He used, he used it to try to convey what the Bible is talking about when it speaks of God's wisdom. Um, I'm not very good at telling these types of stories, so I'll just give you a, a clumsy, brief version of it. Uh, and maybe you've heard something like this before. So the story goes like this. There was a, a, a train switchman, uh, a man who lived near a railroad intersection, okay? And his job was to switch the rail, or switch, switch the, the tracks on a train so that when a train was coming, it would make sure it would be going the right way or the left way. Um, and that was his job. And he lived there, and that was, that was what he was doing. The trains would go by, and they'd go by very quickly. And he lived there because it was sort of off. This is old times, I guess, so he didn't do everything by computer. And he would have the house sort of on a hill where he could see the trains coming from the left and right, and he would flip the switch at the appropriate time. But because he lived there, his family lived there as well, and he also had a child living there with him, uh, his son. Um, and his son was out playing one day, and his son got caught in the tracks. Okay, this is a very contrived story, but I'm trying to make a point. Um, so his son got caught in the tracks, and, and it's like, oh my, my son's caught in the tracks. But all of a sudden, just at that moment, he sees this train, a very, very fast-moving train coming. And this train switchman has a decision to make. Um, he can throw the switch and derail, basically essentially derailing a train, but causing the train not to hit it and kill his son. Or he can let the train go through, protecting all the people on the train, but losing his son. Okay, that's a really brief version of what was otherwise a long story. But in your mind's eye, you sort of get the, 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 the difficult choice that he had to make there. Um, what would be the wise thing to do is the question. What would be the wise thing to do? Not what... And I want you to think about that for a second. It's an interesting question, and I know that as I heard this story, I had this idea in my head. And, I, and if, if you're like me, you're seeing, you're hearing this story, and you're thinking, okay, this is sort of a type of a fellow that's going to die. Well, so let's back up a little. It just given the story and not putting any analogy to it, what would be the wise thing to do? Well, 
well, the wise thing seems to be the save the 400 people on the train and let the one person die. Is four people more important than the one person? But what if that little boy was going to grow up to find a cure for cancer? Or he would be the next Billy Graham? What if that little boy was going to make some huge impact on the world and save thousands, if not millions, of people? I mean, that, how does that compare to 400 people on a train? Or what if one of those people on a train was going to be that person? Or what if the death of one of those people on the train would affect somebody else's life in some sort of way that they would rise to some occasion and millions of people would be saved? And I, You see where I'm going with it. Well, there's no way for us to know that. But there is for God. God can make those types of judgments because we're not playing with all the... We don't have all the information that God does. God is omniscient. Um, when we see the verse, it talks about, Oh, the depths of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. Let's first focus on his knowledge. Um, and this is a very concise summary of his knowledge. Um, his omniscience means omniscience, I think, knowing everything. Um, God knows all things completely. Uh, everything we do, think, and feel, he knows intimately. There, and there's, uh, because of the constraints of time, there's verses that, that, that enforce and talk about all of this, and I have them in my notes. Um, but these aren't things that, that are, we're just throwing out as speculation. There are verses in the Bible that talk about these things. He does know our hearts. He knows the, the words that were going to come off of our mouth before we even speak them. Uh, he knows everything that has ever happened. He knows everything that ever will happen. And probably the most intriguing is he knows everything that could ever possibly happen or could have, in the past tense, he knows everything that could have ever had to have possibly happened, something like that. Um, God can play what if. You and I can't. We're just guessing. But God actually knows, well, if this person did this, then this would happen and this would happen. And there's verses to support that, too. Um, there's one, um, there's a scene where David uh, is asking the Lord, Lord, um, if he's hiding in a city, I think he's hiding in a city called Keilah. If well, if I stay in this city, he's running from, from Saul, the king, who was pursuing him. And David says, if I stay in Keilah, will the people turn me over to, to Saul? And God says, yes, they will. So David leaves. But there is God knowing what would happen, even though that ended up not happening. David did something different. But God knows that there's a... The, I think the more popular one that people refer to is there's a, um, a passage where Jesus says to the he says to the the Israelites around him he says if the people of Tyre and Sidon uh, had seen the things that you have done uh, that you have seen they would have repented. Um, he's God knows not just what is what's actual but he also knows what's possible and with that knowledge. He can exercise his wisdom perfectly. Um, A.W. Tozer has a quote that's similar to the one by Berthoff. Berthoff. Um, the ability, A.W. Tozer says, the ability, wisdom is the ability to, God's ability to devise perfect ends and to achieve those ends by the most perfect means. So the thing I, that I want you to take away from this is it's not just that no better result could be imagined, although that's part of it. No better result could be imagined. But no better way of achieving that result would be possible. God's wisdom is so far above our comprehension, the only appropriate response is faith. We see uh, in the passage that, um, switching gears just a little, the passage uh, Jim read this morning, the cornerstone of God's wisdom the linchpin, the thing that everything in God's plan is, is centered around is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. First, uh, First Corinthians 2, 
However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery or secret, the, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of, the Lord, of, of our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. <clears throat> you have Jesus um, being the cornerstone of God's wisdom, all of God's wisdom, all of his plans, all of his, his the things that he desires. The, 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 the cornerstone of all those things is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and nobody saw it coming. Um, and not only did no one see it coming, but, but it, to the natural man, it, it seems crazy. Verse 7, turning back a chapter to chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding uh, of the prudent. That God would choose to suffer and die to save undeserving people like us seems crazy. And yet, if you look, looking back and looking back at the scriptures and looking back at what happened, it seems clear that nothing short of this would have brought about, brought about the result of our salvation. This is what had to be done. And it's interesting. Uh, it seems so clear and obvious now, but at the time, it, it just made no sense. It was foolishness. He goes on to say, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God, God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, who to the Jews is stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ, what he did for us, and how he lived, his death, his resurrection, is the very personification of God's wisdom. God does, and, and this wisdom is not something that could be perceived through human means. Uh, therefore, it requires faith. God desires above all else our faith in him. Uh, God has designed his plans in such a way that only faith will, will bring people to him. Lastly, if you could read that. Oh, kind of cut off. Um, Ephesians 3. Um, we see uh, an expansion on this. Uh, verse 8, Paul says, To me, who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. To the intent now that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. This is an interesting passage because what we see here is the pinnacle of God's wisdom, the crown jewel, if you will, of God's wisdom is the church, the body of Christ. The, the us, the, those of us living in, in this day and age who have put our, our faith and trust and hope in Jesus Christ, we are, we are his, the pinnacle of his wisdom. Um, it was a mystery, a, it was, but it was the culmination of God's wisdom on display for heavenly beings. I find this whole passage very interesting. There's all kinds of things in it. The idea that that we are on display for the, what's it say? Um, 
verse 10 here. Let's underline it. Um, to the intent now that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. So the, the church is God's uh, uh, embodiment of his, the result of his manifold wisdom. And it's on display to principalities and powers in heavenly places. I don't know who those principalities and powers are. It doesn't tell us. There's a lot of things going on in heaven that we're not told about. And to think that we are being held up as the church as an example of look what God has done for these people, of all people. Look what he's been able to do with them and through them. Um, the, the verse, the, the phrase manifold wisdom caught my eye. And of all the adjectives to use with the word wisdom, um, Paul chose the word manifold. Manifold in the Greek, it means um, much variegated, uh, varied in other words. Um, mar a couple of the, 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 the sources have the phrase like marked with a variety of colors. It's interesting that he used this word. You know, he could have used vast, he could have used infinite. He, there's a lot of adjectives that he could have used. But he used this word manifold, having this idea of much variation, um, a great variety. And um, I think the reason he gave this is, is God's wisdom is more than just one big plan having to do with Jesus Christ, which, it, although it is one big plan having to do with Jesus Christ and what he did with us. Um, Through his wisdom concerning us, um, or although his wisdom concerning us has the single event at its center, every individual who makes up the body of Christ experiences his wisdom in their personal lives. So there's this very personal nature. You have this big idea of God is going to save people through Jesus Christ. But then you break it down into this big group of people is made up of a whole bunch of individual people like you and me. And I think this, this idea of manifold wisdom has to do with God working out his wisdom in each of our lives in a very personal way. Um, he's, he's, I've, I've heard it said before that if there was only one person alive, Jesus Christ still would have died on the cross for that one person. Um, God loves us so much uh, individually as well as collectively, but individually he cares for us. He cares for what's going on in our lives. And he wants to make us holy. He wants to bring us to himself. And he has, exercises his wisdom in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so, as, as looking back, there's two things that I wanted to, for you to take away from this sermon. One is just have this idea that as as members of the body of Christ, we are part of God's manifold wisdom on display in the heavenlies. We are God's crowning achievement. Um, that's kind of a cool thing to think about. But more importantly, in my mind at least, um, the second thing I want you to take away is as part of God's manifold wisdom, he is exercising his wisdom in our life on a very personal level to bring about the most perfect end by the most perfect means. Um, I think one of the reasons that I find, found those passages that I started off with from the Old Testament so um, meaningful to me is because I can kind of relate to them. I find times in my life every day to one degree or another, sometimes the questions are small. Lord, why did you let, you know, what, why, why did this happen? Why did that happen? And sometimes they're bigger. And we all have these these questions, and it doesn't mean that we don't love the Lord, it doesn't mean that we lack faith, but we just don't understand why God is working in a certain way. Um, I mean, it, it can be as, as, as simple as something like, um, you know, why there's a, somebody you were hoping that would come to church and there was this message that was given, why, why wasn't that person in the service for that message? Oh Lord, it would have been perfect. Why didn't you have that person come for that message? Um, well, that's where faith in God's wisdom comes in. Nothing happens by accident. And God knows all the different possibilities, and he's working it out. And we just have to trust. 
Um, you know, it, we were, my dad and I were talking about how there might not be very many people here. I've pre prepared for two weeks on a sermon. There might not be very many people. It's fine. The people that God want to be here through his wisdom will be here. And maybe the only person who really needs to hear this is me. That's fine. But God in his wisdom uh, will we'll, we'll see that through. Sometimes the questions are a lot bigger than that. Lord, why, why am I struggling with this illness? We see Paul who had some sort of infirmity that he prayed and prayed and prayed for. Um, and God's answer was, no, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm not going to heal you of this infirmity. And apparently it was a big obstacle and a big hindrance. But, but God, in his wisdom, had a reason for not healing him for that. We see bigger illnesses. We see even, you know, we lose, we lose people. We wonder why. Um, and yet... That's where faith and God's wisdom comes in. Um, and God wants more than anything, us to have our faith in him, in his plan, his wisdom. Um, and that's all I have. So as we go, well, here, I'll just close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we can have faith in you. We can have faith in your goodness, Lord, we know that you're good. You have a good plan for us, Lord. We know that you're sovereign. And you have the ability to, to, to execute your plans. Lord, we also know you're holy and you want us to be holy like you. But Lord, help us to trust in your wisdom that, that you have a, a perfect plan for our lives, Lord. And, and nothing happens by, by chance or happenstance, Lord, but you're behind it. And through your wisdom, your infinite, manifold wisdom, you have this, this plan for, for us. Lord, help us to put our faith in you. Uh, even if we don't understand why things are happening in our lives, uh, let it be enough that you are God and that you have just infinite love and, and compassion for us. And, and you have a plan and a perfect plan for us. Be with us as we go forward this week. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.